listen, and share. Always glad to see you, and I reached out to Ellis Johnson, the former pastor of this church. We talked together about Ed, and one thing that Ellis told me was, uh, Ed never took a foul home with him. And there was this kind of pause on the phone, and Ellis said, you know, that's a, that's a basketball analogy. I said, I, I don't know, Ellis, we have basketball. Whatever happened on one day would not be brought back forward again the next day. There was simply this gratitude to be in your presence. Ed embodied gratitude. And I suspect that Ed would be very, very glad to see you here today. And I know that his family is very grateful that you have made the effort to come and to be part of this celebration and to surround and to support his family, uh, and especially today, those of you who have chosen to be part of this choir. The choir was Ed's home here, a place where his voice was most clearly heard. And so I thank you, choir members, for gathering together for this special day. It's also a special day that includes a video where Ed stood at this very pulpit and he shared a song with us that became a kind of a tradition, a powerful, powerful song that he couldn't sing this year for the first time. But then we have this video to share with you. So I invite you to uh, join one another in thanksgiving for this life. And now as we turn toward prayer, I invite you to listen to these two perspectives from the Psalms. One saying, I sought God, and God answered me. God delivered me from all of my fears. Those who love God find their lives are radiant. And another said, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the mountain give way, though the earth crumble, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we are gathered here this morning to remember and honor and celebrate the life of Ed Rush. We are family and friends colleagues and neighbors, many of us whose lives have been touched deeply by Ed. And even though we come to celebrate, we also experience loss and grief and change and difficulty. So God, as we sing and as we pray, as we speak and share, as we grip one another's hands and share hugs. May your spirit descend on us. May it settle on us and bring us a sense of peace that passes understanding, of love, of community, of connection to each other, to you. And may all of our actions today, may they be true and may they honor and May they also honor you and bring you glory. We ask this in your name. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand as you are able. The words of the song are found in your program on the left hand side. My life goes on.
These are the things my father was proud of. He was proud of my mom and his family, and everyone spending time together, especially on birthdays and holidays. Big family gatherings made him happy, and we do have a big family. He was so proud to be the first in his family to go to college. He was so proud of his childhood memories of growing up in Buffalo, and he told all the nostalgic stories to everyone. He made sure to visit Buffalo every year and to stop by to enjoy his favorite places. He was proud of telling his bad jokes, and he will be remembered for them. He left people smiling wherever he went. These are the things that my dad liked to do for me. When I was growing up, he made every sacrifice he could to immerse me in music, getting me cello lessons, taking me horseback riding, teaching me to swim and to play soccer. As I got older, he called me whenever there was a snowstorm to make sure that I was safe and I had enough food. He always made sure my car was running and I was safe. He always checked on my health and well-being and made sure I was eating right and that all my insurances were up to date. <laughs> he told me he was thankful that he could perform all his fatherly duties. Up until recently, he was even proud of that. These are the things he liked to talk about. Buffalo, Buffalo, Buffalo. <laughs> He talked about his parents and his family and wanted to learn more about ancestry and history, which is something that we plan to follow up on. He talked a lot about BU and his education and helping to counsel young people about their education. He talked about working at the children's hospital when he was younger. He worked with the children that were stricken with polio and they were bound to their iron rungs. He loved to see their faces when he wheeled them outside into the sunshine. And he talked about his children and his grandchildren. These are the things that my dad liked to do. He liked to listen to music, specifically jazz, Tony Bennett, Nat King Cole, and Michael Buble. He loved to play tennis and go swimming and go to baseball games. He loved his hangouts, which included the Naughty Pine, and he became known as Steady Eddie over there. <laughs> and his favorite bakery, which he called me from, Cape Rada in Wellesley. He liked to volunteer at the Neighborhood Annual Falls Ball every year. He liked talking to everyone and yelling into his beloved bullhorn, which he couldn't get enough of. Drove us crazy. He also liked to play his monthly poker games with the guys and go to church and sing in the choir. He loved the beach and he loved to swim in the ocean. These are the things that he taught me. He taught me about forgiveness. And the only way to move on is to forgive yourself and to forgive others. Life is about second chances and redemption. We all make mistakes. We're human. We learn and we grow from them. That has always been the way it works. And that will always be the way it works. He taught me to be sensitive of myself and others, and it's okay to show me feelings crying. One time we cried together, and I'll never forget it. He taught me that I'm a hard and loyal worker, and that I'm worth my weight in gold. And that if people treat me poorly, it's because they don't know it or realize it yet. Stay gold and treat people with kindness. That was his mantra. He lived life being positive and kind. He didn't take things too seriously. And things can always be fixed. 
his love of family and relatives and friends. Even though he was an only child, it felt as though he wanted to go through life making it his mission to make his own big family and to share his love with the world. The lesson from the Bible is a letter from Paul, the senior St. Paul, to younger Timothy. I'm glad that the family chose this particular lesson. It means a lot to me because Ed, in so many ways, was a mentor to me here in my ministry. And so these words were shared with young Timothy toward the end of Paul's life. Here are these words from 2 Timothy. I give you this charge. Preach the word, in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage, with great patience and careful instruction. Keep your head in all situations. Even endure hardship. Now I am being poured out like the final sweet sip of wine. The time of my departure has come. Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And he concludes this letter with the words, The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all.
Tibetan master Sankhya Pandita said, even in decline, even in decline, the virtuous increase the beauty of their behavior. A burning stick, though turned to the ground, has its flame drawn upward. In Ed's final days in the hospital, I had heard that, although he was not able to speak very clearly, that Ed still enjoyed singing. I had heard that his family visited Ed and had the opportunity to sing carols together. And a part of me didn't really believe it was possible. And on another day, I went to see Ed. And if the speech back and forth wasn't really possible, but then I invited him to sing Silent Night with me. And Ed, sang every note of Silent Night perfectly. And when we prayed the Lord's Prayer together, he didn't necessarily articulate every word, but he knew the cadence of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He knew the cadence because it was a part of him. It's the rhythm of his life. I spent time with him there at the end where the music was playing every day and it was always something like Tony Bennett or Frank Sinatra and this is not really in my wheelhouse, these songs, these, these crooners. And so I listened on my way home, found a channel on Spotify called Crooners and Cocktails. Or maybe it's Cocktails and Crooners and Cocktails kind of enabled the crooner maybe. But. And I'm listening on my way home from the hospital one day and Ray Charles is singing the song, Come Rain or Come Shine. You know the song, Come Rain or Come Shine? I'm gonna love you like nobody's loved you. Come rain or come shine, high as a mountain, deep as a river. Come rain or come shine. You know the rest, happy together, unhappy together, it won't it be fine. Days may be cloudy or sunny, we're in, or we're out of the... I just wanted to check the audience. Here, so you know this. I knew the song, and especially I knew Ray Charles' way of singing it. I learned that Frank Sinatra also offered this song, but Frank Sinatra's uh, telling of the story, his singing of the song, Come Rain or Come Shine, it has kind of a lightness to it. He even sings, uh, I'm with you always. Uh, it's supposed to be I'm with you always, but instead... Frank Sinatra sings, I'm with you, baby. But Ray Charles, when he sings this song of endurance and persistence and patience, when Ray Charles sings it, he sings that last line, I'm with you always, which, by the way, is a gospel affirmation. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. The words from Jesus. Ray Charles sings, I'm with you always, but the part of the song that's so important to hear at the ending of this song, the music just stops and Ray Charles reaches for it. I wish I could sing it the way Ray Charles says, I'm with you always, I'm with you, Ray. And he just climbs our shot, just reaching for it. And it seems to me that's the nature of life and it's the struggle of life and it's the reality of living in partnership together all those years. Cloudy or sunny, in or out of the money. And so when Paul writes to young Timothy, he invites him to fight the good fight. So true of Ed, fighting the good fight. He used to tell me about the time when he was a minister in Worcester during the civil rights, and the people of Worcester didn't quite understand what. Ed was trying to do in bringing white and black together in ministry. And he felt somewhat shunned by his United Methodist Church. We still struggle. We still are fighting that good fight for equality. Ed sometimes fought the good fight with me. He felt like it was his job sometimes. I remember uh, when I first came into this church, we offered communion here, wine, bread, 
But at one point we had a wine goblet and a juice goblet, two different things, and I took one of them away and we just had juice. Ed suffered that with me, but then we shifted from serving this wonderful, wholesome bread to gluten-free bread. And at first we were offering them both together, and then I said, well, why don't we just offer one kind of bread? We don't need to marginalize and divide people at the table of all places. Let's just serve one bread. And we had a gathering in the parish hall where the worship board was offering four different kinds of gluten-free bread for us to taste test, to sample. The best gluten-free bread, by the way, is at Trader Joe's. <laughs> but not for Ed. And that day I asked Ed if he voted. And Ed said, I voted, no gluten-free. <laughs> He said, why do we have to eat gluten-free bread if just a few members of the church are suffering with this? It's tyranny of the minority. <laughs> I would stand here and preach, and Ed would sit with the choir right here. And I often wondered what he was thinking of these sorts of ideas that roll out of a 45-year-old's mouth how much he had to endure. Uh, Ed told me the joke, and this is a joke that it seems like all pastors know. He said there's a, a woman who comes in the back of the church and she's welcomed by the usher. And she tells the usher, I want to sit in the front row. And the usher says, oh, I wouldn't do that. The preacher is uh, terribly boring. You don't want to fall asleep in front of him. And she says, do you know who I am? The usher shakes his head, no. And she said, I'm the preacher's mother. <laughs> and the usher says, do you know who I am? And the mother said, no. And he said, good. <laughs> Thank you for that, my dad. There's a, there's a group that formed here in Massachusetts called Young at Heart. Young at Heart is a group of uh, singers who like the Tony Bennett kind of music, the cocktails and crooners. And there's a documentary about this group called Young at Heart. And there is in this group a kind of a young director who stands before the group and encourages them to move beyond Tony Bennett and beyond some of the old gospel songs and to try something new, something like a song from The Clash called Should I Stay or Should I Go? Oh, there's more of you that know The Clash then. <laughs> Ray Charles, it's interesting. And Ed was one of those who was willing to try this something new. He was willing to deal with whatever ideas I shared. He was willing to endure new ideas in music and even embrace them. In this documentary, Young at Heart, there is one song that's introduced to the group that's called Fix You. It's by the group Coldplay. And the song was written by Chris Martin. It was written for Gwyneth Paltrow. You know Gwyneth Paltrow, the actress? She lost her father. And so he wrote this song for her. And the, the simple words are, when tears, are, tears come streaming down your face, when you lose something you can't replace. And then in a shift in the song, it says, lights will guide you home and ignite your bones. And I will fix you. My 18-year-old son hates that lyric. What does that mean, fix you? It's a gospel word. Fix me, Jesus. Fix. I'd love to fix things. So in this documentary, two men are supposed to sing this song, Fix You. They rehearsed it together, and the night of the performance, the day before, his partner dies. And so the man who had planned to sing this duet on stage is forced to sing it alone. And there he is in the middle of the stage and he's got this oxygen pumping and he's singing this slow song and alternately you hear the oxygen being pushed. And he starts singing, lights will guide you home and his voice begins to fail. It's an impossible thing. Imagine living without someone you can't replace. Impossible to sing alone. But then in this moment in Young at Heart, the lights on the stage come up, and there behind this man, now singing solo, is a choir. Lights will guide you home and ignite your bones. 
and in harmony they sing together, and I will fix you. Brothers and sisters, this is what we do for one another at times like this. Impossible times where we lose something we can't replace. We look to gatherings like this, and we look to choirs like these, and the lights come up, and we hear the very voice of God singing, I will fix you. Our friends are indeed a blessing. 
We learn from them. They make us better people. So our prayer this morning must be one of gratitude for connecting all of us with Ed, but also one of hope that his memory, memory remains vivid and that we all might see more clearly the need for more and more kindness in our hearts and indeed in this world. An attitude exemplified by the gentleness of spirit that defined our good friend, Ed Rush. I'll invite you just to raise a hand. I'll bring the microphone to you. and just encourage you to stand as you talk and talk directly into the microphone. Uh, please also introduce yourselves to us. Hi, I'm Mark Pettit. I have many fond memories of Ed. I remember playing softball with Ed on John Stewart's lower fall softball team up at Hamilton Field. Ed was our pitcher. I remember paddling a canoe with Ed on the Stockbridge Bowl. I remember our fabulous vacation in Italy with the Rausches, the Stewarts, the Rawlings, and the Pettits, all beautifully planned by Carol Rausch. I remember spending many New Year's Eves with the same group, and later with Chris Samuels and Mary Sweezy, going back to the time when we actually stayed up late enough to watch the ball drop. I remember many pool parties at the Rausch's. I remember playing poker with Ed on the first Friday night of every month for 35 years. And most recently, um, up until a very um, short time before his death, if I was watching a Patriots game or a Red Sox game, uh, and there was a big play, I would hear from Ed. If it was a play against the home team, he would call to commiserate or to complain about the officiating. If it was a call for the home team, he would uh, call to share a celebration. So every time I knew that, if I was watching a ball game and there was a big play and the phone rang, I would hear Ed's voice. I'm going to miss that voice and the person behind that voice. from us who's gone many years, and Ed, and he just um, 
I realized when we started the service looking at the picture that I feel like he's still alive, like he wasn't in my daily life, but he was a constant presence and I feel like he still is. He always had some advice for us. We also have a pool, so the person who did it was a lot of pool advice. There was always music advice. Um, I think not that one gave us a pile of scores that he had found. He just, he just was always looking out for us. He would, we'd see him walk by and he'd stop in and you know, it didn't matter what we were doing, he would just pop in and, and give us some advice. Um, I remember hearing him when, when Joy decided we should do a model here, because she had three of models, and Ed talked about all the times that he had, had what was the, his character's name in a model? Casper. And he talked about everything. You know, Ed had a lot of stories. <laughs> We're talking about the same Ed, but there was the crazy Ed that we all knew too. And, and the, the stories that, that um, when we saw him in the mall, it was like, oh my god, like he was, he was fabulous. He just embodied that character. And we still, uh, I think today still will we'll say, eh, eh, was that the, the thing that he said? Eh, what did he say? We, we, we'll, Conjuring up the memory of Ed and Mom. Um, I, I suppose I could go on with little memories that would be meaningful to anyone else, but I just frankly can't imagine the world without Ed Rash. It's an entire loss. Um, I guess
I wanted to express uh, Pastor's gratitude for Mark returning to be with us to capture this on video for the family. Um, also, this photo that you see of that was taken just around the corner by Marcy Stewart. Uh, it's a beautiful picture of Ed and Mark <coughs> together. Today we wanted to be able to focus on, on Ed, but I encourage you to take a look down the hall at the picture of them together. That's the way it will be locked in my memory. Any others who'd like a chance to share? Much sharing will happen in the room next door, and formally we will have the opportunity to uh, be in a receiving line together or make our way to share our, our individual stories with Carol. At this time, though, I invite you to join your hearts in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Holy One, our home. Although we did not have the opportunity to hear Ed's voice singing, bring him home. Something of Ed's voice is still present with us in our homes, in our neighborhoods. It's true, some part of him still lives within us, anyone who has met him. Holy God. Open wide the doors to this eternal home for Ed. And Holy One, bind this family together, though we come from many different parts of the country, even the world. We are bound together in a common hope and a common gratitude. This day we offer you thanks for the life we live, imperfect though it is. We offer our thanksgiving for a place like this, where it is safe to share, safe to cry, and important to forgive. So we gather again together, finding forgiveness in our hearts because Ed told us to. And Ed knew about forgiveness because it was something that saturated his life and his theology. God, might we finally turn the grace from some of these who are saints who have had to live forgiveness. Might this be an example to us as we look toward our future as a nation? Might we become good stewards of this earth, good stewards of relationship, and might we deepen our faith as now we release Ed to your love and care, comfort us in our loss, Bind us as one choir together as we reflect on the life of Jesus and the words of Jesus. I will not leave you orphaned, he promised. And so we become this for one another, brothers and sisters. Ed was one of the last people, God, you know, to call me brother. It was an old way of clergy connecting with one another, brothers and sisters. For binding us together as brothers and sisters in this place, God, we use this one prayer, which is commonly shared across the Christian family. And so hear us as we pray the words which are printed in our program. Stand and sing grace. Number three seventy-eight. Number three seventy-eight. 